views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, pursuant to Chapter 4, Section 85, and Chapter 69, Section 2706 of the New York City Charter, a joint meeting of the Bronx Borough Service Cabinet and the Bronx Borough Board will take place on Thursday, July 12, 2017, at 9.15 a.m. at 198 East 161st Street, 10th Floor Conference Room. We have three items on the agenda today, uh, the first one being a voting item, and we're going to have to uh, hold off on that one because we do not have the necessary quorum. But uh, the second item is the select bus service for Bronx 6, uh, and the third one is an overview of services. So without any further ado, I'd like to ask Kyle Gebhardt, uh, Transit Development from MTA and New York City Transit and Commissioner Navarro Lopez uh, uh, from the Department of Transportation to begin to make your presentation. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Evan Bialostatsky uh, from Bus Service Planning at New York City Transit. Uh, this is Kyle Gebhardt from Department of Transportation. We're here to give an update on bringing select bus service to the BX6. Uh, so um, this is the uh, BX6 bus route, which travels um, from Upper Manhattan, Washington Heights, um, all the way across 161st, 163rd Streets into Hunts Point. Uh, currently is a local bus making all local stops. We are bringing select bus service uh, to this route, similar to what is on BX41 on Webster Avenue, BX12 on Fordham Road, and Q44 on the Cross Bronx Service Road. Um, in addition to bringing uh, installing off-board fare collection machines uh, like those other routes and all-door boarding. Uh, with BX6, we are creating a, a, a skip-stop service in addition to the local service, a select service which makes only certain high ridership stops. So this map shows with these plus signs where those SBS uh, select bus stops will be. Within the Bronx, you can see River Avenue, Sherman Avenue here right out in front of this building. Uh, Melrose Third and et cetera, down into Hunts Point. Um, so the BX6 SBS will only stop at these stops. BX6 local will continue to serve uh, basically nearly all current stops. Um, and the current frequencies of the BX6 will basically be split between the BX6 SBS and the BX6 local, with a little bit increased um, additional service where we have the resources to do so. Um, but I want to turn it over to Kyle, who wants to uh, speak to the construction that's happening now and coming soon, um, which is the main purpose for our update this morning. All right, thanks, Evan. So f first, I'm going to kind of just run through the, the street design. I, I know we've, we've, a lot of you have seen this at the community board meetings and other outreach we've done, uh, but just kind of as a refresher. So one of the key elements we're doing as a part of the uh, BX6 uh, street design on 161st Street is, is this eastbound um, busway underneath the, the tunnel that goes under Grand Concourse. So this would begin over at the Yankee Stadium crosswalk. So this is Yankee Stadium up here, McComb Sand Bridge is over here, uh, and this is actually where the, the tunnel would begin. So the main line will be bus only uh, between the hours of 7 a.m. and 8 p.m. Monday through Friday. Traffic is still allowed to enter the tunnel overnight and on weekends, uh, but during those times, all of the traffic uh, would be diverted to the, the service road. Uh, making the, the main line uh, eastbound only, or bus only eastbound. So here's a view uh, from River Avenue. Uh, this is also a location where we have these one foot sidewalks which we'll be able to expand. On the north side we'll be constructing that into concrete. On the south side for now it will be in temporary painted materials, but in an upcoming capital project we'll be able to extend it uh, in, in concrete. And again, this is where the, the busway would, con would continue uh, eastbound through the tunnel. So here's just an overhead view of, of that same thing. 
Uh, this is River Avenue, uh, eastbound busway, and this is where the, the uh, sidewalks would be extended as well. So what, what, one other piece of this, uh, through a lot of our outreach uh, and traffic analysis, we saw a, a lot of major issues with the intersection at 161st Street and Grand Concourse. So as a part of this project, uh, we will be restricting uh, the southbound left turn from Grand Concourse onto 161st Street. As an alternative, uh, vehicles can take 165th Street or overshoot uh, 161st Street and then turn right or left on 158th to, to access 161st Street. So moving on to right in front of where we are uh, right now, this is uh, 161st Street in Sheridan. So this is the area we'll be, co be constructing two concrete bus boarding islands in the center of the roadway. So the first one you've probably seen has just started construction, so there's demolition going on right now. So this is the island that is being constructed right now. So that will be the westbound boarding island. And this is where you see the, the busway coming from the tunnel. Westbound traffic will still be allowed to enter the tunnel at all times. Here's the overhead view again. So here's where we are right now. This is the island that is currently under construction. Looking the other direction, heading eastbound, this is where the other island will be constructed. So we will be constructing the island first, that right now, uh, the westbound one in front of Sheridan. Once that one is complete, then this one will be constructed <laughs> immediately after. Here's the overhead view uh, again as well. And this is the point where Westbound traffic will be able to merge into this lane if they'd like to enter the tunnel. Okay. I got this. Okay. Uh, moving on to Elton Avenue. So this is, uh, this is a section that we are currently implementing right now, uh, the new markings in this section. So while we're doing the concrete work here in front of the courthouses, uh, we're implementing these markings, uh, which includes a series of bus lanes. Uh, this bus lane on the curb will be 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday to Friday to allow overnight parking, weekend parking. Uh, the offset bus lanes uh, and the left turn will be 24 hours. Uh, but these markings are, are being implemented currently. And then moving on to 163rd Street, uh, the three beginning at Tiffany Street, these, these last three blocks, there'll be a offset bus lane uh, implemented. And this is something that we're implementing uh, beginning this week. Uh, and we, we should have it wrapped up in the, in, in the next week or two. So this will begin at Tiffany Street and then continue up to Southern Boulevard. And there's still, uh, as with all bus lanes, just as a reminder, right turns are still being able to made from the bus lane. So at Southern Boulevard, uh, the left lane will be for through traffic and right turns will be made from the bus lane. So we're, we're, we're looking to launch this service in September. Uh, so right now we're, we're doing construction. So uh, we've just started those concrete islands. So each of these elements just kind of going through them. So the bus boarding <coughs> islands, we're looking to implement these this month and next month. Uh, immediately after, we'll be doing the sidewalk extension between 161st Street, between River Ave and Girard Ave, right there, uh, but near the subway station. Currently, we're doing the markings on Elton Ave and 163rd Street. And then next month, as we finish these concrete elements, we'll be doing the markings on 161st Street, followed by putting up new signage, uh, saying what the bus lane hours are, uh, new, new signage directing traffic, lane assignment signs, things of that nature. And then currently also, you may have noticed we've been doing the fare machine installation. So I believe we have uh, five locations completed right now. So you'll, you'll see at the actual bus stops, construction of installing the fare machines and the real-time SBS bus time displays as well. And then, like I said, we're looking to launch the service in September. And with that, we're happy to take any questions. Okay. Uh, I have a question, and I'm still confused about the left turn restriction mm -hmm. from southbound concourse onto 161st Street. You said that we can make the turn at either 165th Street mm -hmm. or 100, what was the other street? So there, there's, a, there's a couple. 158th? Yeah, so, so because this left turn will be restricted, uh, there's a couple other options for vehicles that need to go east on 161st. If they're coming from further, further north, they can make the left on 165th and then make the right on Morris. Or alternatively, a vehicle could go past 161st Street and make three rights uh, at 158th Street or make, three, or make a left on 158th, left on Grand, or Congress Village West, and then right on 161. 
All right. Have you done a traffic study at 158th Street on Sheridan or Concourse Village West? Because that's a nightmare getting through there now before you even put the restriction into effect. I go through there practically every day, and every day it takes me a, a quite a bit of time to get from 158th Street to 161st Street because of all the activity that's going on there. You have delivery trucks. Uh, you have the Social Security office building there. You also have a housing uh, a, a, a housing services building there that, in addition to Concourse Village. Mm -hmm. So you've got a lot of traffic going on that street now. Do you, are you sure that you're gonna make traffic better or are you gonna make it worse? So yeah, we, and this is a good question. We, we did a, a very detailed traffic analysis and, and we definitely didn't take this decision lightly to restrict this left turn at all um, because of the, the impacts that it can, it can have elsewhere. But yes, our traffic analysis did include uh, these reroutes and what the impacts would be. I would also say too, is that you know when we're doing our traffic analysis, we're doing a lot of modeling, right? And we're, and we're trying to make assumptions of where people will go. Uh, but we'll be monitoring this very closely and looking to make adjustments uh, with this to make sure that traffic does not get worse. Okay. Are there any questions on this? Any other comments on this? Okay, yes. Uh, one question. Um, along, we have Concourse Village West and 161st Street. Are you saying the traffic is going to move down 158 and Concourse Village West? Because that is congested now. You have mm -hmm. cars that are three lanes deep parked right. on that street. One lane can go through because there's car, there are cars parked on either side. One, you have three lanes. Mm -hmm. So I am totally confused how you think that this is going to work along a 158th. So these are the three different options that vehicles can take. Uh, we, did, we, we, we did analysis too to see the vehicles that are making this left turn, you know, wh where are they headed? And we found that a vast majority of these vehicles are going further east are going east of Morris. So most likely most vehicles will actually take 158th. This is just if you, or sorry, most vehicles will take 165th, most likely. There will be some that will take 158th, but because you said, uh, you know, one reason is because of that congestion, they're much more likely to take 165. Will this be all day or is this dur only during rush hour? So the left turn restriction will be all day. Yes, George. Hey, how you doing? Um, just real quick, right in front of this building, um, the same question that Kitty brought up from Community Board 4, you're building an island, so you're basically making it one lane right here on 161st Street in either direction. Um, are you going to no park? I mean, I know this is a bus stop, but you have constantly police vehicles or service vehicles that are parked in the bus lane. Mm -hmm. Are you guys looking at no parking that? Because... Um, if you go back to the slide, you'll see that it becomes increasingly difficult, especially if people are making right turns into the parking lot over here, um, that you're going to be causing jam ups. Yeah, right there where the coffee cart is, all that is a bus stop. I'm, I don't even know if they moved the bus stop, but are you going to no park that so that in the event that somebody stalls, gets broken down, because you're going to have very limited mo uh, maneuverability with the island right there in the middle? Yeah, so. Right now, um, th this, this will all become legal parking. Uh, right now, as we know, it, it's actually, this currently, right now, is actually a curbside bus lane. But in reality, it's parked up all the time. Uh, so often, this actually comes down to, to one lane anyway. Uh, so this would become legal parking, and it, it would be one lane in this direction. And we've done a lot of traffic analysis. What, what, one thing that we'll be doing, um, because right now, this, at this intersection, there's not a lot of green time given to Sheridan Avenue because there's the service road and main line go at separate times. So we'll be giving a lot more green time here so a lot more traffic we'll be able to get through. Uh, but yeah, but currently this, this curbside will, will, will be parking. Yes, Mr. Vitaliano. Uh, heading westbound. It's not working. 
heading westbound. Mm -hmm. I, I get it to see it one six with the entrance into the parkway. You're putting an aisle in there. Now, if you go on westbound, we want to get into that parking way lane, up into that parking garage. How do we do it? Mm -hmm. So um, go back, Evan, one. Two. This right way, you know, the entrance. Uh, go one more, Evan. Yeah, so, so you're talking about right here. No, no. Uh, coming down one six one, heading west, right. Uh, heading west. Th there's the entrance to the parking. You have to make a left turn to get to into the, the parking lot. Yes. Yeah. So, so, so right here, and you would make a left from from this line. No, 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 no. The next it's, one. it's before that. It's before the corner. Yes. The crosswalk. Where the stand is, you, you know, where does you yeah. see the part, the, the the coffee stand. There's an entrance into the parking lot there. Yeah, so this is the, the parking lot's right here. Yeah, okay. Sherman. Now, where the coffee, if you're putting, an, you're putting an aisle in there? So, Evan, go, go back to the photo. Um, so you're talking about. It's going to be around, down here on the bottom right. Yeah, the, 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 it's right here. So, so at this point, vehicles enter this, this, this lane right here. It's actually very hard to see because the bus is blocking it. Uh, but they, they can make the left just as they do now. It's at the parking lot, not to the curb, not to the street. To, yeah, the to the parking lot, yes. They can. Yes, yes, they can. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, yes. Roberta. Yeah, um, on 163rd Street, going towards Southern Boulevard in mm -hmm. Board 2, we presently right now have a traffic jam from and you're shaking your head so obviously you've seen no, it I <laughs> and now you're suggesting to take one lane away mm -hmm. and so that means you're just going to add on another more more traffic mm -hmm. more much more problems for people to get by 163rd street and southern boulevard of course. yeah so because all that traffic is going into the Bruckner boulevard mm -hmm. and turning and turning uh, left yeah, so uh, a, a couple things here. We, so we, we did a lot of traffic analysis at, the, at this intersection as well. Uh, while there, there one lane will be a bus lane, uh, right turns will still be able to be made from that bus lane. So, so right turns will get, at, right turners and buses will get out of the through lane. We'll also be adding green time to 163rd Street uh, to allow more traffic to get through. And uh, one other thing is that this is an intersection too that we're, we're, we're looking at very long term as well. Uh, there's going to be a, a capital project that's looking a lot at this intersection as well. So we're looking at a lot of the traffic to see how this performs, but also how it can improve traffic for the intersection. Yeah, but west of Simpson mm -hmm. coming this way, uh, which is um, Kelly, mm -hmm. Fox, Beck, all of that, we get jam packed <laughs> as it is on a daily basis now. Yeah. And we got two lanes. Mm -hmm. If you take one lane away, how is traffic going to get by? Yeah, so one, you know, what, one of our, our, our goals here is, is the, because of this traffic, the bus gets really hung up here as well. So we really want to be able to get the bus through, and we, and we, and we want to make sure that we... we I'm not taking traffic. anything away from the people that use the buses. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about people that are using their cars, mm -hmm. that are using that, that thoroughfare to get to Bruckner Boulevard. You're you can right. get into Hunts Point, get into and turn left. It it, it, it is very they don't, they don't count. No, no, it's just it, it, it's we, we so the problem still becomes our problem in the community board. So is we understand the 163rd Street approaching Southern is, is is very congested, and it's something that we are are very concerned about. Well, uh, as well. So you know why we want to move the bus, we also want to move traffic as well, and that's that's one reason why we're adding more green time at this intersection. Unfortunately, we're. we're Honestly, we're not going to be able to solve the congestion here, but it is something that we can uh, try to manage as best we can. We're still just going to end up having the problem, and it, it actually escalate even worse, because now people just, you know, the trucks are going, buses go through there, trucks that are going to Hunts Point go mm -hmm. through there, um, and, and the cars go through there. And, you, and what you're basically telling us is, yeah, we, we know, but we're sorry. Did you do a, a, a traffic study of that? Yes, yeah, so we've done an extensive traffic study. And I, the other thing I would say is this isn't something that we will implement and walk away. It's something that we will be monitoring very closely and making sure that traffic is not getting significantly worse. It's, it, it's right now really bad. I, I agree. It it's is, almost it's getting heavy. to Interville, and, and, and you're going to add on to even more. Mm -hmm. Sam?
Good morning. Um, I'm Sam Goodman, transportation planner for Bronx Borough President Ruben Diaz, Jr. Thank you for coming. Um, the issue that the deputy raised concerning 158th Street and Concourse Village West, I believe, is underestimated in its severity. That is a nightmare, largely as a consequence of triple parking by police vehicles at between 159 and 161. So having said that, the question is, can signs be installed north of 165 that advise people as they're traveling southbound that there is no left turn at 161? Mm -hmm. Because what's going to happen is, the instinct mm -hmm. is, you're going to get to 161st Street. You're not going to be able to make that left turn. And when you get to 158th Street, the inclination is to make the left turn, not to go right and go all the way around. Yeah. Because to go right and all the way around actually requires an additional three traffic signaled intersections to pass. Mm -hmm. No one's going to do that. And the consequence is, on 158th Street, you literally will have cars back from Concourse Village West onto the Grand Concourse. Because right now at 158th Street and Concourse Village West, trucks and V police vehicles are triple parking, and it'll be difficult enough to just negotiate that left turn onto Concourse Village West. So the objective has to be to get people who want to make that left turn to go and to be advised at 167 or 166 that 161 is not available to them. And I really would urge you to really concentrate on how to make that understood so we don't have a terrific problem at 158. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that, that suggestion. That, that's definitely something that, that, that we can look into, for sure. Yes, uh, before I yeah. go to the next person, I will thank you, Sam, for your comments. Because what I just remembered is that you have two parking lots on Concourse Village West, south of 158th Street. Mm -hmm. And when there's a Yankee game, you don't want to go in there. So I, you need to take those things into consideration also. Uh, Dr. Bola. Well, okay. Thank you so much, <laughs> uh, Madam Deputy, thank you. Well, um, what I've seen lately, especially with most of these presentations across the board, it's uh, unfortunately between the bike lane and safe pedest pedestrian safety improvement, it seems to create a traffic uh, backup in our various district. So my question to you, do you have a model of these anywhere else in the city? Because it occurs to me, it seems most of these are pilot studies. Yeah, so, so we've, we, we've done uh, SPS projects throughout the city, uh, including several, several routes in the Bronx. And as a part of that, so we of course do a lot of traffic analysis before implementing them, but also we do a thorough evaluation of them afterwards to see what is the impact to bus speeds, what is the impact to bus ridership, what's the impact to traffic, both traffic speeds and traffic volumes. And because our, our, our goal as an agency is, is we don't want to implement a project that is going to make traffic significantly worse. And so we've seen on these other routes uh, that often we have seen bus speeds increase, bus ridership increase, uh, but traffic also not getting significantly worse. And so uh, we will do the same thing with this route as well, uh, do a full evaluation. And if things aren't working, uh, we can make adjustments. Uh, could you turn your phone off, please? Matthew? Hi, good morning, Matthew Shuffler. Um, on 161st, I know on 149th you have the no left turns, but you have it at a certain time. I don't think it's a good idea to have no left turn the entire day, being that the select bus service is only a couple of hours during the day. So I don't know if y'all can make a recommendation to make an edit to that, but that no left turn for the entire day, I don't think that's right. Yeah, and, and so currently we are doing the 24-hour the restriction, and, and a lot of that is for clarity to drivers. We want to make sure that it's, it's very clear. Um, we, 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 ha we have done time-restricted uh, left turns. Um, we find them that it, it's a little bit more, more challenging to give a clear message to drivers. Uh, but as, as we said, too, this is something that, that we can monitor, and if, you know, we can definitely take that under advisement. Okay. Yes. Uh, 
Um, hey, so I kind of wanted to ricochet off of um, what Mr. Roberto was speaking about. So, you know, I, I think we have a lot of these new bus lanes, a lot of the, uh, the bus lanes for the select service run through most of our community boards. So my concern is I want to know, can we have a select bus without a bus only lane? Because, you know, and I'm, I'm completely biased because I live on Webster Avenue. So I see the congestion from what the select bus service was and what it is now. And yeah, the select bus service uh, lane is consistently empty. However, the lanes back up blocks. And 161 is a mess to get into. It's typically easier to get to the courthouse via subway than any other means of transportation, including bike, you know, walking, like maybe it's even even so you're walking. So I wanna know if we can get a select bus service without the lanes. Yeah, so, so one thing we looked at with this route, on, on a lot of routes, you know, we, we look at implementing uh, bus lanes throughout good portions of the corridor. And here, the, actually, the, the, the number of, of bus lanes that are actually implemented is actually very small. So we put it in very targeted areas uh, where the bus faces significant congestion. So with select bus service, there's is kind of a, a, a whole host of improvements that, that make it work. So the off-board fare collection speeds up the bus at bus stops, for example. But at areas where the bus gets very congested, that's where the bus lanes is really our best tool. So for this route, uh, we actually looked at not doing bus lanes throughout the whole corridor. Like when, once you get east of Morris, uh, the congestion actually eases up and, and, and the bus moves a bit better. Uh, so we really just focused on the really congested areas. And like you said, 161st Street right now isn't working for anybody. Uh, it's, it's just a double parking kind of nightmare. Uh, it's not working for drivers, for buses, for pedestrians. The bus currently drops off in the middle of the street and bus riders have to walk between parked cars. Uh, so we're really trying to address that with this project. Um, but yeah, so, so we're, we're, we're looking at you know, doing bus lanes where they're gonna have the most impact. Okay, and, and then just a follow up question. With your select bus services, is, okay, can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. With your select bus services, I know you guys take up um, a significant, you have different bus stops mm -hmm. from the select bus to the regular bus. Um, how many bus stops is it going to be? Do you know? And, uh, Evan, do you want to take that one? Uh, sure, I don't remember the exact number offhand, but about half of the current bus stops will be select bus stops. Okay, so, um, so about every other current BX6 stop will be a select bus stop. And yes, we, are, we will be um, lengthening some of those stops by, by a bit to ha make sure both, uh, both the BX6 SBS and BX6 local can pull to the curb for prop proper wheelchair boarding for buses. So it would be an additional bus stop at at least half of the stops that we have now. So it's about three parking spaces that I'd be taking away? Or Th like it varies by, by bus stop. It depends on the site condition. Sometimes there's a driveway just past the current bus stop, so we can't extend it at all. Other times the current bus stop is way too short for what it is right now. So I, I'd have to, you know, it, there, there's, no, there's no normal. But yes, in general, some, some of the bus stops will be extended a bit. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Saunders. Uh, yes, uh, one thing that I believe strongly that would eliminate some of the congestion here, and that is to revisit the connection of that 153rd Street Bridge, because Thank that you. will take the Thank traffic yes. across to the concourse and alleviate some of the congestion that you have. So I certainly hope that you'll get on board with us with the, uh, revisiting the construction of 153rd Street Bridge is most important for this district. We are in favor of that. Yeah. I mean, that's not a DOT. The DOT is not against the, the construction of that bridge. Okay, so we'll have it in writing from you, right? Your support. <laughs> uh, talking to the mic. Oh, sorry. We have made a request to OMB to have the construction of the East 153rd Street Bridge a priority. Yeah, it, it needs to be. We agree. Marisol. Good morning. I just, I just have a few questions on the monitoring of the project. How do you, how do you plan to do that? I know that we've talked about signage at 165th Street to make that turn, 
But how are you going to make sure that people are making those turns where they're supposed to make them as a and their restriction at 161st Street? How is that going to be enforced? In other words, are you going to be putting people out there to make sure that that's not being done? So yeah, so 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 as, as far as that goes, you know, we will be putting up a significant amount of signage, and, and there will be kind of the the new tag as as well that will help, um, and. On, you know, we'll work with NYPD as well uh, for, for enforcing that restriction as, as well. Um, and, and the other thing too is just you know, being out there, seeing how it works, uh, doing data collection, but also uh, hearing from the public as well. So you know, if, if you guys feel like there's something that isn't clear, isn't working, uh, please let us know uh, and we can look at ways to, to address it and so mitigate it. The other thing is I know that usually when you implement these, these bus routes into SBS, you also have what they call the ambassador program. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you're going to be implementing here? And I would suggest that you do it for the lo for a longer period of time than the normal two weeks, mm -hmm. because this is going to be a big problem for a lot of people along that route. So you may have to have a whole lot more ambassadors and for a longer period of time. Uh, so yes, we we are planning our usual work. when when we when we launch a new SBS route, we put. Um, a lot of our office staff, a lot of our bus dispatchers out at bus stops for the first 10 days, two weeks, depends on the project, because yes, it's a big change, and especially on the BX6 with the new stopping pattern for the SBS, we are expecting confusion, people not knowing where the bus goes, which bus do I want. Um, what we've noticed on mo more recent launches is that the need is the most for ambassadors is, most is the greatest on the first day. You know, commuters, people who are going to school, once they figure it out once, on Monday, they don't need help on Tuesday. So our plan is to throw as many people as we can out on the first weekday, or the first Sunday when we usually launch, the first weekday, and start to taper off from that. We hope to get most customers at the beginning. Um, so um, I'm not sure exactly if we'll go the full two weeks this time, but, but our goal is to get everyone as soon as possible. Um, and did you mention when it was going to start? Uh, we are targeting September. I, I really think that you should plan for the two weeks and even more because again this is going to cause a lot of confusion a lot of congestion along the route even I understand when you hit it once and everybody will understand but that doesn't necessarily work because we have different populations coming down that street other than the regular oh I'm going to school I'm going to drop off my parent my child <laughs> sometimes it's the parent <laughs> sometimes it could be the parent um, so but it, the, it's, it's a whole, I mean, there's a, different, there's a different dynamic that occurs along this corridor. So I think you're going to have to have it. And, and when I say longer than the two weeks, I, I really urge you to consider that because you will be hearing it more so from the 163rd Street corridor. You'll probably hear it over here on the concourse because that, that concourse gets backed up now. J on the concourse itself, forget the restriction. So how that turn on 158 is going to work is, is, is just going to be amazing to see. So I, I really urge planning to have ambassadors out there at those crucial points. Okay, understood. Thank, Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments? Seeing none, I want to thank you for coming in and letting us know what to prepare for. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you again. <laughs> okay, we're waiting for the one person one person to come to make the quorum. So in the interim, I want to go to an overview of service services. We have a presentation by Jelani Anglin, community organizer for Good Call. Jelani, will you come forth, please? Uh, do I just use this mic? Use the microphone. Yeah, you can take that. Thank you. All right. So first off, I want to thank everybody for allowing me the opportunity to speak. My name is Jelani Anglin. I am the co-founder and community organizer of Good Call. Uh, we are a service that launched 10 months ago in the Bronx. Uh, we plan to be citywide before the end of the year. 
Uh, there is a one-sheeter that I believe was given out with some information about Good Call. Uh, you can look at that. We also will be going into a presentation that explains why we need Good Call, how Good Call works, our team, our mission, our vision, what we plan for this summer with Good Call, and then I'll leave uh, time for questions. So I'm going to begin. Every year, there are over 300,000 arrests. Most of these arrests are in low-income communities, and the majority are for low-level misdemeanors. With these arrests, there are 47,000 people that go to jail only because they can't pay bail. With that being said, on average, folks are spending 50 days in Rikers Island and other pre-child detention centers because of the ability not to pay bail. This costs the city over a billion dollars a year for these low-level arrests. Other than the cost to the city, the cost to the folks is detrimental. We've heard things like loss of job, school expulsion, loss of child custody, compromised immigration status, an undeserved criminal record for copying a plea for something you didn't do, and I'm sure folks know about that Khalif Browder story, the mental trauma. So for a second, I want everybody to take a step back and think. Imagine that you were arrested. So I want everybody to think about this process. You know, you were out on Friday night and you were, you know, out, fit the description, you were arrested. By a show of hands, I want everybody to think about how many folks would have a loved one that would pick up at 2 a.m. in the event of arrest. You can show your hands now. All right, so out of everybody that showed their hands, would that person that you called have a criminal justice attorney that they can reach that would be able to help you and give you information at 2 a.m.? Well, you're very lucky. <laughs> That's not the case for many people in the community. So today, when you're arrested, you're stripped of all of your belongings. You're stripped of your shoelaces, your belt, your phone, your wallet, and you're given the option to make a call on a dial pad phone. In this era where we you know, rely on our phones so heavily, many folks don't even remember a number of someone that they can call. With that being said, they don't know who to contact to get legal help or legal advice about what is going on in that moment. That leads to folks having to see a lawyer right across from the central booking five to 10 minutes before they actually are seeing a judge and that judge is actually fighting for their freedom. This arrest process is what's happening right now and this has caused some problems and it will continue to cause problems if we don't utilize resources that we already have. So, we create a good call. And what good call is, is we are a completely free 24 seven hotline in case of arrest. We connect folks with the lawyer automatically and allow them to contact their loved ones with just one phone call. So, this is an overview of how the pr arrest process works with good call. If someone's arrested, they can call our hotline at 8-333-GOOD-CALL. They then will be connected to a legal service provider who will pick up the phone and invoke their rights, tell the police that they cannot be interrogated until they are present and cannot be put up in a lineup. Then their loved one will receive an alert if they are registered on our site that says, well, this was created by our designer, so Stephanie, but insert name there, has been arrested. We are, our old number was 347-95 Bronx. We are now 8-333-GOOD-CALL. But they will receive a text that says, your loved one has been arrested. Please contact this hotline so that you can find out information and know what's going on with your, uh, with your significant other or your loved one. So with that happening, now your loved one has time to gather bail if needed talk to the lawyer and provide information about community ties, and that will hopefully strengthen the chance of that person that was arrested being released on their own recognizance rather than being held 
at Rikers Island because there is a lack of knowledge about community ties or there just wasn't enough time to prepare a great case. So I want to dive into this alert for a second. The way this alert works now is we have a web tool that we built. Our web tool allows folks two options. You can sign up on our website for the protect yourself option, which allows you to list your name and a couple of emergency contacts. So that God forbid in that situation of arrest, you can identify yourself on our hotline and then your emergency contacts will be contacted via text automatically. We also have another feature that says be there for a loved one. Uh, internally we call this grandma sign up because the way this sign up works is you can be a person that, don't, that doesn't believe that you'll be arrested. However, if you have loved ones that are in the Bronx or someone that you care about in the Bronx and you're afraid of them fitting, this, fitting the description, you can easily just sign up your name on our web directory and it's kind of like the yellow pages. So God forbid in the event of arrest that someone that you know gets arrested, they can look you up, answer one unique identifying question to see if that is the person that they would like to contact, and you can receive an alert without even being saved as their emergency contact. Sorry, give me a second. There we go. So, we launched Good Call last year in October of 2016. We partnered with the Bronx Defenders and we kind of worked with a, a, a small area in the Bronx as a proof of concept pilot. During this time, we were able to process a great amount of calls. We got signups and we got a lot of community insight that went into our iteration on how we could develop the service to better serve the community. Recently, we just onboarded Legal Aid Society CJU onto our platform which means that now we have more lawyers to provide support in case of an arrest 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Today, we've processed 500 plus calls and we recently, uh, as of last month, just launched our Good Summer Campaign, which I'll get into a bit. By the end of 2017, we have a very ambitious goal of being citywide. This is our team. Myself, I uh, had a little more hair back then. Uh, Gabe, our product manager, Eugene, our developer, Stephanie, our designer. We're a team of four. Uh, our founding team came together in Blue Ridge Labs, which is a spin-out from the Robin Hood Foundation. Uh, we were in a tech incubator discovering how to make technology for low-income communities and some of the problems that they deal with. Through a lot of human-centered design and research, we were able to circle around the arrest process. And also, I'm not afraid to admit that I was arrested before, and I know the process. So with all of us coming together and using our strengths and our capabilities, we were able to create Good Call. This is our engagement team. Aramis is our neighborhood manager, who I actually met at a tenant association meeting here in the Bronx. He was a young guy that was very uh, eccentric about his community and cared so much about the things that were happening that he wanted to come on board as a volunteer. These are our interns, Dominica, Rosemary, and Brian. They are interns that were given to us by uh, Apple Corps and John Jay, and they want to be involved in the legal in, in the law enforcement field. So they are very hands-on. They're actually going to be uh, outside soon uh, at the BXD Bronx party, that uh, block party that's happening. We try to make sure that we put our engagement team in the community so that they are able to reach the people that need the services the most. Our mission is to make the arrest process and its aftermath less painful and harmful for those that are detained and their loved ones. We want to build towards a future where no one is punished because of what they look like, how much money they have, or where they're from. We know that both of these are very ambitious goals, <laughs> but you know, uh, you have to set high goals if you actually want to make change. So I said that we launched our Good Summer Campaign. Our Good Summer Campaign is based around defending our youth. As the summer comes around, well, summer's here, the youth is out from school, youth home from college, police interaction goes up. Our main goal with this campaign is to sign up as many folks as possible to save an emergency contact or to be there for someone as an emergency contact. 
we also are spreading uh, these cards in the community with the number on it. We want to make sure that we raise awareness about Good Call so that everybody knows about this number and this hotline. So our strategy for this campaign is a hilltop and grassroots approach. We want to have our street outreach, which is where we have some folks on the ground. We have our social media. Everybody utilizes their phone. I watched a couple people on their phone in here. You know, you use your phone every day to communicate. We hope that with social media, we can share information about Good Call and we can read, reach a wider audience. We also want to lean on organizations and community groups that deal directly with the populations that we are trying to serve. So let's take a deeper look into that. With our street outreach, we're going to be doing small business canvassing, events, attending tenant association meetings, block parties, and subway outreach. Our plan this summer is to blanket the Bronx from the ground and from the community centers. We want to make sure that we're reaching the parents, we're reaching the grandparents, and then we're also directly coming in contact with the youth that may utilize this service if need be. We next will be using social media, putting out infographics, videos, and email blasts. We want to make sure that we are able to reach folks on the internet. Because we have a web platform that allows folks to save an emergency contact, with utilizing social media, putting our link there, you're only one click away from being able to save an emergency contact and help somebody in the future if they need it. Next, most importantly, is our organizational referrals and collaborations. We are a tech-centered, we are our, uh, sorry, we are a tech community-centered nonprofit. Uh, emphasis on tech and community-centered. We've been doing this for almost a year now, but there are folks in this room and organizations that you all know that have been doing this a lot longer. We are not trying to compete. We would like to collaborate with all of these groups so that we can get the information out and so that we can better serve the community. So we're reaching out to all the organizations. I'm gonna give out my card at the end. I also will say my email at the end. Please reach out to me. I will have our engagement team coming out to share cards with you that can be given out in your area. Any events, shoot them our way. We will make sure that our engagement team is there. Our goal is to make sure that we are hitting all the areas in the Bronx so that folks know the service and are able to utilize it if they need. We've also been partnering with some great organizations here in the Bronx, the Bronx Defenders, Legal Aid Society, SOS, Bronx Community College, Single Stop, just to name a few. We keep adding to this list and we want to keep continuing to grow and that is why I'm here and need your help and cooperation to make sure that we are able to spread this service and to prevent folks getting arrested for fitting the description or if that happens, being able to provide a resource so that folks do not feel alone in this situation and they know that there is somebody there to help them. You know, folks that have money and come from other sides of town are able to call a lawyer ASAP and they're able to be there. That doesn't happen for folks that live in the NYCHAs or other communities that can't afford a lawyer. So we want to bridge that gap and that's why I'm here and we need your help. So I want to thank you guys so much. I'm going to open the floor for questions. Well, thank you for that presentation. Um, it's a very commendable thing that you're doing. Uh, are there any questions or comments on this? Yes. First off, I think it is a great idea, as everyone else said. But I just have a, a concern with the, um, the text alert. Yes. So how, being that, let's say someone signs up this summer. You know, you hope your loved one doesn't get arrested, but maybe two years on the line they do. You may forget you signed up for the service. How do you differentiate yourself from seeming like a scam? Because uh, not nothing against the organization, it, it can come across in that sense. I have a friend whose grandmother was actually scammed in the same sense, where they called her saying he was arrested and she had to wire money to bail him out. And she sent $2,000 to bail him out. And then obviously you're not gonna go that route, but someone may brush off the text because it just seems like a scam. Hmm. So we actually have uh, two technological features which we added, uh, which allows folks to, as soon as you sign up, you can send a message to the person that you've signed at, up as your emergency contact, notifying them, letting them know that I've listed you as an emergency contact, keep a heads up or keep a lookout. Uh, we also make sure that in our text that we put the number there and ask folks to call. We don't say anything else referring to money. Uh, we don't even release the last name of the person. 
we just say, please call this number so you can find out more information. So we're hoping that by clarifying that in the first text that they see, mm -hmm. they're able to really uh, differentiate in between a scam and a resource. Okay. Any yes. other, I see somebody's hand, yes. Um, are there are there any other features besides the text um, that could notify a loved one? Uh, because there are folks that, um, I mean, if people do use their cell phones, but mostly to make, make calls. Some folks um, who are wiser uh, may not be as tech savvy. So um, is there another feature for that as well? Yeah. Uh, on an analog style, the lawyers still call uh, the loved ones, and they can call you know, the landline and see if anything is going on. Uh, this is just one of the ways that we try to implement to streamline the process. But we still, uh, the, the old ways will still be utilized of the lawyer calling a landline if need be. Okay, Dr. Bola. Uh, thank you so much, it's a good presentation. Thank How you. do you protect the uh, privacy of the individuals that uh, utilize your services? Yes. And how um, do you share information? Yes. Uh, so I'm only smiling about that because our team has toiled about that for so long and we have to go through many things with the Bronx Defenders and Legal Aid Society asking those questions. Uh, so our engineer who before this was from New Zealand, worked at NASA, uh, was very strong about information security. So we have a feature that actually, well not a feature, it built into our site is delinking. So that the emergency contacts and the person that listed it is delinked. That information, if ever subpoenaed by the police, will just look like a long list of names with no linking of relationships or contacts. It also requires keys. So this information is secured in between data keys uh, and encryption so that you can't just access it plainly. You would need keys to actually get the information. Continue. Just, just a, um, a follow-up question. Yes. Um, with some of the training that I've taken, uh, when they're conducting an investigation, yes. when it comes to looks like uh, by association, even the person that you call to come and bail you out yes. is also being investigated. And that's why I'm asking, how do you protect these identities? Because even if you delink it in an investigation, they still, they don't want to be associated. A typical example, we know that um, some of the folks who are bad elements in our community, um, they don't want to go through any of this route. Mm -hmm. And yet, some of the younger folks who are initiated into their group gets into trouble without their parents knowing or even next body knowing. And those are the ones that we want to be able to assist. But at the same time, when the investigation is being carried out, it's extended to their godfathers and rabbis and on and on. So that's why I'm asking if you have something in place that will create that kind of... Uh... So I'm gonna try to answer your question the best way that I can, because there were a couple points I wanted to touch on there. Uh, first, when police do investigations and they wanna look into your ties and see who to contact, um, they have ways of doing that regardless, by calling in friends, associates, and things of that nature, and people of that nature. Um, so we can't prevent that. When it comes to our, our web platform and the connection of who your emergency contact is and who you called, all of that information is private. We don't share that information. Um, that information is protected. When it comes to doing investigations about the people that come in to bail you out, I believe that that is something that goes beyond the hotline or the service because if the person did not use our service and just called somebody on the analog phone, if they remembered their number, they would still go through the same process. So I think that's more of a police uh, investigation and interrogation processes uh, question than maybe our service in our dealings with that, if that makes sense. Did that answer your question? Uh, well, yes, it did. Uh, I mean, you did try, 90%. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> I must give you credit. Uh, I'll give you my email. We can get to 100. Thank you. You get to 100. All right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, are there any others? Seeing none, I wanna, oh, okay. Hold on, let us get you the mic. And give me your name, please. My name is Aisha Bamba. I'm from the, okay. co uh, the council member's office. Um, so question, could, uh, and this might be a little more down the realm. If someone you know, signed up for your, your program and actually got arrested like you may, maybe a week or, or two after, um, could the prosecution argue that it was a premeditated um, incident because they signed up for your service? So because Would there is- Would that be like a, a, and you know, you work with the legal yeah, yeah. so. Yeah, so that is why we uh, separate and we redact some information because if you are signed up for this resource regardless, uh, doesn't mean that you were gonna commit a crime, it may mean that you feel unsafe. And if they do get arrested two weeks down the line, Yes, that happens, but there is no way of them knowing that they have signed up for this service and the date in which they signed up, because that information is not available. So if they subpoenaed them, sorry, if they subpoenaed you, they, they wouldn't, wouldn't be see, able to receive that. They would only see the fact that they signed up. They, they wouldn't be able to see the time or the date or the emergency contact. Okay. And they would probably have a hard time seeing the names because the names are encrypted, which takes a key uh, to actually get those names unlocked to actually view what they are. Oh. Thank you. Okay. okay. I want to thank you for coming in and sharing. Uh, some of the boards may be interested in having you come and speak before their boards, and you can make that contact uh, with them individually. Can I just give my email right now so everyone sure. can write it down? Go right ahead. Okay, great. All right. Uh, so my email is Jelani, J E L. A N I at good call G O O D C A L L dot N Y C. Uh, I handle all of our community engagement, community outreach, our tablings. If it deals with community, that's me. So just reach out to me. Uh, I will get back to you. And also, our team is willing to come out. We have a bunch of these cards that I'll leave on the table outside. Uh, everybody can get their own personal stack. We have a bunch of them. We want to make sure they get out to the community. You also will probably be seeing us outside of the bookings uh, throughout the week doing outreach. We stand right outside the bookings and hand out information. You can always pass by our table and give us some information if you want us to come to your neighborhood, come to your meetings, we will do so. We really just want to make sure that we're able to reach the youth this summer. Uh, we also are going to be sharing emails. Please, if you have a listserv email list, share our information because we just want to make sure that these resources get in the right hands before it's too late. Uh, thank you guys so much for your time, and I sincerely appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, our final item, we now have a quorum. Our final item is a voting item. It's the ULERP application C16253MMX requesting a modification of legal grades on Westchester Avenue between Waters Place and Hutchinson River Parkway East, uh, the service road in community districts 10 and 11. And we have a presentation by Keith Kalb, uh, the borough deputy commissioner for the Department of Transportation, yes. Good morning. Do you have a presentation? I don't have a presentation, okay. but I handed okay. out, I handed okay, out a good. couple of slides from our presentation that we made to community boards 10 and 11 for the ULA process, and we presented, we had a presentation for the borough president's uh, land use hearing last week. Um, I'll just read a brief um, statement about it, and then I'll answer your questions. You should all have a copy of the uh, slides, the seven slides that are pertinent to this application. Uh, the Westchester Avenue Bridge over the Hutchinson River Parkway, Project HBX 1086. Is it, we are presenting an application for amendment to the city map for modica modification of the legal grades on Westchester Avenue between Waters Place and Hutchinson River Parkway Service Road under application C160253MMX. New York City DOT 
is applying to modify the legal grade along Westchester Avenue in the Bronx to facilitate the rehabilitation of the bridge. The section of Westchester Avenue that was raised extends from the intersection of Waters Place and Westchester Avenue to the intersection of Westchester Avenue with the Hutchinson River Parkway East Service Road and includes the bridge. The major substandard feature of the bridge is the lack of vertical clearance between the parkway, travel lanes below, and the bottom of the structure girders of the Westchester Avenue above. The posted vertical clearance is 10 feet 2 inches, far less than the 12 feet 6 inch minimum required by the AASHTO standards for parkways with passenger cars. The bridge is being raised in order to provide a minimum of 12 feet 6 inch standard vertical clearance between the structure and the parkway below. The maximum increase in elevation is one foot four inches. Commercial traffic is not permitted on the parkway, but errant trucks do access the parkway and strike the structure. Of New York City's 790 bridges, this bridge is struck more than any other bridge anywhere else in the city. In 2014, the bridge was struck 18 times, more than once a month, in 2015, 13 times. In 2016, 13 times again. And so far in 2017, through the first five months, uh, the bridge has been struck seven times. Wow. The increased elevation of the structure will not permit interstate or oversized trucks free passage, nor prevent all bridge strikes. The AASHTO standard vertical clearance for commercial traffic is 14 feet, six inches. However, each bridge strike that the increased elevation prevents avoids the potential for tragedy like the one that occurred several years ago when a vehicle was unable to stop before striking the truck and the, sh the sh sorry striking the truck that struck the bridge resulting in fatalities so i provided you with um, seven uh, of the important slides that show the existing bridge conditions um, and also, the project needs, which is sort of outlined in the statement that I made, and then uh, some photos of the bridge strike. Uh, that's uh, project needed bridge strikes. And then um, there's a couple of other slides that outline our Euler process, the project objectives, uh, the challenges with the, with, the, with the structure. Obviously, you know the Hutch Metro Center, uh, Montefiore, and Einstein are very close to this bridge structure. Um, and Waters Place feeds into the Westchester Avenue bridge and connects to the Hutchinson River Service Road. And so we're planning to maintain two lanes of travel in each direction on the Westchester Avenue bridge while maintaining uh, MTA bus services up and down Westchester Avenue and as well as included maintaining the train service that is above Westchester Avenue, which is even above the Westchester Avenue bridge. That is why we are asking for your, a map change on, the, on this construction project. Okay. Okay. Are there any comments? Mr. Vitaliano? Good morning, Keith. Good morning. How are you? Uh, good so far. Keith, you gave us stats. I could go back maybe 15 years. And every time you wake up in the morning, you hear about that, that, a truck hitting that thing. How come in 2017 we finally are uh, addressing that issue? How come it wasn't addressed 10, 15, maybe 20 years ago? I know it's before your time. I mean, this is how the city works. I mean, th think about it. And I'm sure there are other bridges throughout the city that need the same uh, type of uh, addressing, okay? Uh, could you answer that? Why did it take so long? I mean, we, uh, you know, we're a city agency. We're mandated to, to, to uh, oversee the 789 or so bridge structures in the entire borough. Um, our priorities and our funding is, is not unlimited. We couldn't fix every bridge every year. It's not, it's not feasible to do that. Well, so. you Keith, you said there were fatalities a couple of years ago. Right, but I mean, wouldn't that trigger something? Maybe it should be addressed a couple of years ago? But these things are not done with a magic wand. These things require, you know, okay. design and, uh, you know, data analysis, and they need to be uh, designed in order to be appropriate. We need to coordinate with the MTA, with the 
bridge, the structure above us. We need to maintain traffic. We need to maintain uh, the Hutchinson River Parkway underneath. It's not as easy as you know throwing right. in or okay. raising a roadway. All right, Kate. All right, thank you. <laughs> John. Good morning, Kate. Thank you. Good, Good morning, morning, everyone. Thank you. Well, obviously, Community Board 10 welcomes the. Uh, the reconstruction of the bridge because of all the uh, the numbers and the bad stats that you've been uh, telling us. My only concern is in the next few months, we're going to have, I think, four different um, uh, projects being done. You have the Westchester Avenue exit coming off the Hutch, southbound, going to be worked on. Uh, I see um, there's uh, an area that the, the, the staging area. That's is part that of this for that? Project. Is that for this that? Is this okay. Project. Okay. Correct. Great. So we we had that. Now we also have the the traffic on Waters Place already, which is atrocious, and we're going to have the Unionport Bridge. Yep. What I'm asking for, what Community Board Ten is asking for, project that's correct on East Chester Road at Morris Park Avenue. Correct. So I mean, we have four different pro at least four different projects, and I've been asking f for many years now for traffic agents. Okay, I've, we've written letters to PD, we spoke to you guys, yeah. we need the traffic agents there at all times. Well, at least at times of, of the, you know, the, the major traffic. We, we are providing, as part of this contract, there will be uh, traffic control agents assigned to this project. Great. And we're, of course, maintaining two lanes of traffic in all directions on the bridge. Great, all right, and I, I appreciate that. Um, also, the digital sign, you got, I think, I, I'm not sure if you guys put it up, there's a digital sign, northbound Hutch, right by the gas station. Correct. Right, exit here. Correct. Can we, Can that be moved back, or can we have another one? I don't hate to spend money, but can that one be moved back towards, the like, Whitestone? the Whitestone Bridge? You know, because that's where, the uh, I guess, the trucks coming off the Whitestone, they veer off to the Hutch, and they I, they might get confused. That's why they get they go that way. So we can explore that, but there are two options for vehicles, for oversized vehicles. They can either get off at Bruckner, which is bef after, the, after, you, after the split, after the I-95 Hutch split, they can go to Bruckner, or they can get off at Tremont Avenue. So they have two options. No, I know that, that but, if, the, but if they see that big sign, which is a great, you just, must have just put it up there weeks, a couple of weeks ago, because I haven't seen that until no, no, maybe it's recently. It's been there for years. No, 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 no. It's a brand new sign there. It's a big red, a big red sign, red digital. digital. Yeah, it's, it was just put there maybe a week or two ago. I used that, that entrance. I'll look into it. Please. I'll look into if it. If it could be moved back before the trucks come that far, that we, would, we that would be ideal. It. That's, that's yeah. And we'll take a look at it. Um, thank you. And then, um, if we could, if if this possible, I'm not sure if we have it. But the statement that you just read off with all the numbers and stats, can we get a copy of that for the board? Yes. Just, just for the, uh, I guess, ten and I eleven, can provide a copy and whoever else wants it. I read this at. We read this essentially at both. I'm sure you did. I, I'm sure you did. But if if we could, you know, I like it's the numbers. Essentially the same. Great. All right, and that's that's all my concern is is the traffic agents. Thank you. No, we had a hearing at Community Board 11 that Joe uh, had. Yeah, at the ULIP hearing, the Land Use Committee. We, I mean, essentially, it was slightly different, but it was essentially the same, <laughs> same <laughs> text. Okay. And we okay. did the same at CB10 for their ULIP hearing. Are there any other questions, comments on this issue? Okay, we'll go, oh, George. I'll make it real quick, Kreef. Um So you're make, putting shallower girders on it so that trucks can pass underneath? We're or are you elevating the structure itself? We are, we are narrowing the, the girders. OK, so, there's no, so you're not lifting it. You're just making it correct. shallower so that we're trucks limited, can pass We're under. limited at how high we can go because of the elevated subway structure on Westchester Avenue. So if we elevate the substruct, the, the roadway, higher, then vehicles will not be able to pass. Uh, well, that was, my question was going to be, is, isn't there a concern also with vehicles hitting the elevated subway structures as well? Not the, the, the train, but the, 
posts that are in the street? Uh, currently, there are, uh, they call them pork chops. There are little, um, it's hard to explain, but there's, where the L of the, what the L structure is, there are diagonal uh, connections, supports, connecting those two structures. We are changing them inside the, the bridge area to a narrower uh, uh, profile that will allow vehicles on Westchester Avenue to continue with unobstructed. Okay. Any others? Well, I want to thank you. Um, thank we can you. go to the. We can go to the vote now. On this one, the chairs of community board ten and eleven will be voting along with the city council representatives. Okay. So first, uh, this is a ULARP application C160253MMX requesting a modification of legal grades on Westchester Avenue between Waters Place and Hutchinson River Parkway East Service Road in Community Districts 10 and 11. Okay, and we'll go directly to the vote. Um, for Board 10, John? Board 10 approves the uh, project moving forward. Okay, and for Board 11, Anthony? Yes, Community Board 11 approves the project. Okay. Uh, we, don't, we have uh, a representative from uh, Councilman Cabrera's office. How do you vote? Yes. And a re representative from Councilman Torres? Abstain. You abstain. Uh, Councilwoman Gibson? Uh, yes. Councilman Salamanca? Yes. And Councilwoman Palmer? Yes. Okay. Okay, so the votes carry. Um, it has passed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. And with that, I want to take a moment before we adjourn to welcome Rosemary Ginty, who is the new chair of Community Board 8. Congratulations. And I want to congratulate all of those of you who were reelected as chairs. Uh, and with that, uh, we have no announcements. We have no announcements. Okay, and with that, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. We are together. And for the last 20 years, we have been building on a vision to share our views, our voices, on our channels. We are the Bronx. We are BronxNet. I got this as a paid internship. Spending my time here, I really enjoyed the people that work here. I enjoy what goes on behind the scenes. So far, I've learned how to operate a camera, how to host. I learned how to control audio. My first time hosting was really nerve wracking but I really enjoyed it because it was a new experience.
coming to you from our BronxNet studios, four new shows highlighting some of the best of the Bronx has to offer. We sit down with political leaders on In the District and discuss local legislation, events, and issues. See how the community and business come together with The Bronx Now on BronxNet. Nosotros features leaders from a Latino community. Meet those who are moving to make a difference in public service, business, arts, and culture. Looking for new and exciting dining experiences? Then you'll want to savor the Bronx and try new restaurants and eateries that fill the borough with delicious dishes. We have it all, so experience the Bronx in new and fresh ways on BronxNet. From the north to the south to the west to the east, we are expanding our services and upgrading technology at Lehman College. And now, Bronxites have an innovative media production facility in the East Bronx at Mercy College in the Hutch Metro Center. The windows on the East Bronx studio a state-of-the-art control room, media labs for production and training, and other media-capable spaces. Training, workforce development, leading-edge technology, and programs that help you share your ideas, your voice, on your channels, locally and globally. Build media and technology skills at BronxNet and build your dreams. and sudden and the great white way the Bronx is where I want to stay from Fordham Road to City Isle the folks all greet you with a smile Strolling up the concourse on a summer's day We'll tell you why I'll never stray Fourth of July out at Orchard Beach Neath the summer sky Forget, we've got the Yankees too. So now you know why I'll never roam far from the place that I call home. You'll never find a better place to be. Yes, 
Suppose I told you kids, you could rule the world, your own chunk of the world. Film, the iconic expression of emotion, ideals, and culture through moving images. Throughout the decades, the world of filmmaking, from its physical appearance to the essence of what it portrays, has adapted and grown into an historical structure made of both dreams and imagination. The same can be said about the Bronx itself, a place where film has flourished in its past to now return home for the borough's cinematic future. For filmmakers, the Bronx became a hidden gem, capable of adapting to any script location, from the hustle and bustle of the urban streets to quiet suburban neighborhoods. Thomas Edison built the Edison Studio with this thought in mind. Well, the first studio in the Bronx uh, was uh, established by Thomas Edison, and therefore it was called the Edison Studios. It was located on Decatur Avenue and Oliver Place, just about a block south of Bedford Park Boulevard, and just about a block to the west of Southern Boulevard. And it was an attempt by Edison actually to place a studio within the boundaries of New York City, but also in an area where he could uh, profitably use all of the surrounding area for any type of, uh, uh, of film that he would want. The Botanical Garden was uh, practically across the street. Uh, he could use suburban settings for the housing that were around if he wanted to go urban. And uh, people who were actors or people who worked in the movies could very easily get up there uh, using the 3rd Avenue L, which had a stop at Bedford Park Boulevard. We can't accept that. I didn't give it to you. I gave it to your son. He worked for you. That's right, my son. And I don't want my son involved in what goes on here. Involved in what? What are you talking about? Please, I'm not a stupid man, okay? Please, I'm not stupid. You know what I'm talking about. Just stay away from my son. Okay? As filmmaking grew into a multi-million dollar industry, the Bronx's booming talents became key players in introducing Hollywood to the undeniable Bronx flavor. It's made me who I am today. It's made me the strong, brave woman that I am today. It made me tough, so I would have to say that that's one of the things that growing up in the Bronx um, allows you to be and teaches you to be, which is tough, which is a good thing to be in Hollywood. As a Bronx filmmaker, you know, I'm here because we want to have our voice and be a part of the change necessary in our community and have that input. Whenever anybody asks me to describe myself or define myself in under 10 words, I always say the same exact thing. I just say, I'm a Jew from the Bronx. But the Bronx is homegrown talent that has stayed here to build it. Over time, the Bronx's connection to film was reborn. Numerous film studios are once again looking towards the borough, not only as the perfect location to showcase their motion pictures, but to create powerful, inspirational, and diverse stories waiting to be brought to life on the big screen. I grew up into filmmaking here in, in, in this atmosphere. And in fact, my very first class was at BronxNet uh, in field production, you know, get your hands on a camera type situation. This is where I learned the art of filmmaking. I think being born here and knowing and understand that we are a diverse borough have either uh, a struggle that they've had to go through or some who have been here for generations that um, have kept the, their communities intact and, and, and thriving. So to me, it's always been about uh, taking those things from each one of those communities and instilling it in myself. I always recognize when I do see the Bronx and uh, I'm pretty familiar with 
a lot of the neighborhoods in the Bronx, so I always, I think it's recognizable and unique and interesting. Just as being a Bronx filmmaker, I do think it's, uh, it's a good thing to kind of show the Bronx and, you know, the Bronx is a, is a character within itself, really. If you're in the Bronx, shoot as much as you can in and around the, the borough that you live in or your neighborhood so you can sort of see what it looks like and let other people see because that's ultimately how you're going to promote any kind of Bronx filmmaking, letting people see the Bronx. Alan and I are excited to officially open Silver Cup North today and to provide more studio space to accommodate the growing needs of New York's film and television production industry. And even more so, we're excited to be opening this facility in the Bronx, which has seen an incredible resurgence and excited to be part of the Bronx's current renaissance. Silver Cup Studios has kept their mission alive and well. Since first opening their doors in 1983, the studio established itself as the largest independent full-service film and television production facility in the Northeastern United States. The company finds a home here in the Bronx, honoring the diversity of the borough while giving the opportunity to students to have a first hand in their careers of film and television. When we started with this, we had a couple of new hires and, and right out of the gate, we hired people from the Bronx. You know, part of the, you know, the purpose in doing these programs with various folks is also to make certain that the diversity of cultures that we have, both in the Bronx, Queens, and what have you, everyone has an opportunity to see if this business is for them. From the first moments Thomas Edison walked onto the sets of the Edison Studios in 1907, the Bronx became a rich and key role in the world of film. The tradition is honored today through its filmmakers, actors, producers, and creative students. For the Bronx and its people, film has created a light through the past, into the present, and towards the future. We are together. And for the last 20 years, we have been building on a vision to share our views, our voices, on our channels. We are the Bronx. We are BronxNet. I got this as a paid internship. Spending my time here, I really enjoyed the people that work here. I enjoy what goes on behind the scenes. So far, I've learned how to operate a camera, how to host. I learned how to control audio. My first time hosting was really nerve-wracking but I really enjoyed it because it was a new experience. 